Now, just a note, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. That is the website. We have a special there, 1888. You get most of what we've recorded since this program began in 2006. Hours and hours, something like 100 hours of podcast on various historical and political topics. If you like this program, you'll like more of it. 1888, it's www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Go there. Within 24 hours or so, you'll get a URL that takes you to where the archives are. Thank you for those who have supported the program. The District of Columbia's population has boomed in recent years. It is becoming a popular place to live as well as work. Yet its residents have no voice over the most important aspect of federal government, Congress. They do pay U.S. income tax, but don't vote for representatives to determine how that's spent. They have a non-voting House member, currently Eleanor Holmes Norton. She can vote on committees, but not on regular votes of the House of Representatives. Every license plate in the district reads, no taxation without representation. The 23rd Amendment gave D.C. residents three electoral votes, though those votes have yet to be decisive in a presidential election. Had a couple close ones recently, though, and there's always the possibility that they may come in to be decisive. But since the passage of the 23rd, they haven't been decisive. When its population was declining, there was less talk about D.C. statehood. But now that it has the population of at least one other state, talk is more serious. It is a crime against democracy that residents of D.C. cannot determine how their tax dollars are spent. They cannot elect representatives to declare whether we should go to war with another nation, or, as is so often the case in modern times, whether we support a president's decision to use military force. They don't have representatives to do that. We have no direct evidence that George Washington or Thomas Jefferson wanted the residents of the federal city called for in the Constitution to vote, but there's certainly no evidence that they wanted them to be disenfranchised. The capital was in Philadelphia in the early years, and residents of that city voted, and residents of Philadelphia had representatives according to their population. The capital was in New York for a few years, and residents in that city voted, and the city's population had representatives according to its population. There was no distinction made during the time that those cities were federal cities that a certain area wouldn't have representation. It would make no sense for the Constitution to create a city in which people would not have rights. The more logical explanation is they didn't think of it because as of the time of the Constitutional Convention, the federal city didn't exist. It was just a concept put in the document that there should be a federal city. It would be about 13 years after the Constitution that Washington, D.C. would be in effect open for business. And even then it was small. It was so small and thus, while not correct, the offense to democracy of not having representatives for those living there was small. Now, as the city has over a half a million, the offense to democracy is that much larger. So it's clear that D.C. should have some type of federal representation. But is statehood the answer? Statehood would bring a House member easily and two senators. Based on voting trends, it would probably bring two Democratic senators in, and very likely two very liberal senators in. And so once again, like throughout history, there is concern about the Senate when it comes to a new state. The same concern that was present when California, Texas, Missouri, Maine, the Dakotas, and so many other states were brought in. There's a concern about state government, given the checkered history of mayors running D.C., I don't dismiss those. D.C. government has been getting better in recent years, and I don't dismiss completely the political realities. But I do dismiss any notion that the founders wouldn't have wanted D.C. to have representation in Congress. 
It would be against everything in the founding documents to assume that. It is true that elections are already conducted by states, and D.C. is not a state. But there's no way they would have considered that the federal city would grow to 591,833 people, one-twentieth of the population of America's biggest city, New York. So if compared to the biggest city of that time, Philadelphia, at about 40,000 people, I can't imagine that a community of 2,000 Americans would have been neglected. That would have been a large community then. The city wasn't that large. It was so small. It had such little population. Most of the people living there were representatives or people who were voting somewhere else. It was an oversight, not a mandate for the future. 600,000 people. The District of Columbia has more population than Wyoming. It has more population than the Constitutional Republic monarchy of uh, Luxembourg, with 493,500 people. Luxembourg, of course, has 999 square miles, but this is more than D.C.'s 63 miles. Herein lies the problem. Statehood. That's harder to overcome. Delaware has 873,000 people. But there are over 2,490 square miles. D.C., just 63. Now, physical distance doesn't necessarily matter. If physical distance mattered, there would be specific language in the Constitution determining what the size of a state should be. It's not in there. We have Jefferson weighing in. We have the precedent of every other state which has been larger since the original 13. But there's no language in the Constitution for that. Strictly constitutional speaking, it doesn't matter. Congress can vote to make a three-square-mile area a state if the state it is in consents, or if it's built out of a new territory. There is no absolute definition of what statehood is or what a state is. The idea of a city-state is not totally without precedent. Virginia, for instance, has counties and then cities. So Richmond and Alexandria are cities. They're not just simply a city within a county. They have their own jurisdiction within the state. New York City uh, offers a similar example. New York puts, uh, New York consists of several counties. Each borough of the city of New York is a county. So while you, New York City doesn't represent itself to the state as a separate entity from the rest of the state, it consists of counties that exactly duplicate its borough borders. Constitutionally speaking, we could make the District of Columbia a city-state, though it would be 40 times smaller than Delaware. That's strictly constitutional speaking. The physical size might create two problems. Duplication. Would we now have a state and city government taxing residents and perhaps duplicating services and confusing jurisdiction in its borders. And the second is the potential growth or decline. We assume that the District of Columbia is at 591,000 and growing. And if it grows, that's great. It could even get two House members then and go further to justify its statehood status as it eclipses other states in population that are even bigger. But what if it declines? Once you create a state, that's it. I mean, it could be carved in half with its consent. It could give up land to Virginia or Maryland. But there seems to be no way in the Constitution to erase a state. It is an entity of the United States. So once we make it a state, it's permanent. So even if the population shrinks to 250,000, they will still get two senators as does California. This could be said, of course, of any state. There will be people moving in and people moving out all the time. But when a state consists of just one city, and cities are at different times fashionable and at different times not, there might be a greater danger of that population loss than in a larger land mass area with lots of different places subject to different population trends. And even a third problem may be copycats. 
If you allow a city-state, the District of Columbia, does New York now ask to be a state? Does Chicago? Does Los Angeles? Based on what we've seen, the confused history of states, their origins, their borders, their reasons for being, I see no reason why a state of the District of Columbia is not possible. Of course, the permanence is a strong issue, governance is an issue, and how the politics will work out. It might be very tempting right now for Democrats to add two likely Democratic senators to the permanent mix. Just as in the 19th century, Republicans added what they thought at least were two, four, eight permanent Western senators likely to be Republicans by adding new states. There may or may not be support for such an, e an effort. It may require constitutional amendment. Ray may require something that really hasn't happened before, and that's have the full weight of the White House of a president behind the D.C. statehood effort for it to happen. But the mechanism's not hard. It's a simple vote of Congress signed by the president. To me, though, the issue is more of representation and not statehood. D.C. residents pay income taxes, and no one in the House represents them, the key place where bills of money are originated. It should be a shame to most Americans, and if they knew it, I believe fair-minded Americans would agree. Most polls do show support for representation by D.C. Statehood's not the only way. There's a couple of ways to do it. And one is to give D.C. a voting House member. That may sound not sound like much. One vote out of what would then be 430 six members of Congress. Or perhaps if we held a number at 435 and just uh, take took it out of some area that's losing population, just be the addition of one out of 435. That may not seem like much. But over time, it could mean a lot. A single House member right now is, is very little. As they grow, as they join committees, if they keep getting reelected, they become more powerful. House has a lot of, there's a lot of benefits to seniority in the House. And that person could become very influential, far beyond just the one out of 435 or 36. Another option is to allow the population of D.C. to vote in either Maryland or Virginia in the Senate and House races. Population would have an obvious impact on these states, and they would have federal representation, senators and congresspeople eager to do work for them. The archive to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics has a lot of information on topics such as the one we just talked about. And many other things. It has most of what I've recorded, what many of you who have listened to the program have heard throughout the years of my attempts to take a look at great American questions or small political concerns and apply a dose of history to them. For instance, in 2009, we took a look at socialism, its history. President Obama's routinely called a socialist, but what really does that mean? It was at one time the most successful third party in American politics. We talked about some well-known socialists like Eugene Debs. He never became president, though his absence might have helped to elect Wilson in 1916. But we talked about some unknown ones, like Helen Keller and Jack London. The episode on socialism is the most downloaded episode of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Ever. In 2010, we asked if health care is constitutional. Well, we got it right, sort of. In the same year, we looked at drones and the way warfare has changed over the years. We predicted it might be scary if drones were ever brought to America. Little did I know that it would be a way for Amazon to deliver packages to people. In 2010, we looked at the origins of the Civil War. And, among other things, we compared it to the breakup of the Beatles. But we also took a serious look as to why the war started, why it lasted so long, why people fought. Or at least we tried to. 
I mentioned those four topics because those four are the most downloaded episodes of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics in All Time. Some of the two million downloads that we've had on this program in its entirety. Other popular ones are Medicare Atmosphere, where we talked about the beginnings of Medicare and the space race. The Dark Side of Rights was a very popular cast. Can Deists Carry Firearms? That was a pretty popular one. The Misunderstood Ninth Amendment. And the recent cast on the Fourth Amendment. Those are among the most popular, most downloaded. If you're new to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, you haven't heard many of these episodes, maybe the Fourth Amendment one. But they are in the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics archive. In fact, there's hours and hours of episodes there. Now, it is more than any audiobook. Your average audiobook, you're talking about six to eight to ten hours. There's hours and hours of podcasts in this archive. And now you can listen to them for an affordable price. We've lowered the price on the archive to 1888, a nice rounded number, and the year that Benjamin Harrison was elected. Well, he wasn't really a memorable president, but it's an easy way to remember the price, perhaps, and it's a kind of a round number with the three eights. 1888. Plus, it's a great offer. You get the entire archive for 1888. Now, this is simple. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. Click on the link. You do this. Within 24 hours, you're going to get the link to a special website where you can get all of those archive podcast file and at your convenience, download it to your iTunes or your whatever system you're using. The podcasts are just simply listed on a site, but they are in chronological order. Some of my favorite podcasts in the archive are Shall Propose Amendments, where we go into each of the amendments from Amendment 11 to Amendment 27 to the Constitution and what their history was. Another one that I like, $2 bill versus $10 bill, where we discuss the different approaches to government that have been battling throughout American history. The Great Depression, where we talk about what it was really like to be in a depression. And this was recorded in 2008, so we're comparing it to the Great Recession that was going on then. The History of the Secret Service, one of my favorite podcasts in the archive. And there are many, many others. So go there, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. It's 1888. I'll add something else. There are some who are going to say, Bruce, I love your program. I can't afford the 1888. What can I do? A few others might say, I'd like to help you out more than that. Help you out more than 1888. Or they might say, I've been listening to you for seven years, have all your programs, I don't need the archive, etc. Well, I also have a donation link. I get great enjoyment from doing the show, but the show does have some costs, books, microphone equipment. I just recently got a new microphone arm, so I am speaking to you now, standing up. All the equipment that comes around that, boards, compressors, the like, website fees, You can make a donation at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. If you like the program, if you're somebody that donates to public radio, think of it that way. I'm a program you enjoy. You know, keep it funded. If you make any donation, I'm going to throw the archive link your way so you'll have access to the archive. I'm a nice guy that way. I'm I'm really something. So, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. But wait, there's more. Always wanted to say that. But wait, there's more. I'm adding a special additional item to the archive offer. A special extra podcast, What Can an 1100 Member Congress Do for You and Other Thoughts About Representation? This takes a look at this very important, crucial issue of American representation. What it was like during the Revolutionary War period, what it was like in the early formation of the American government, what it's like today, what it's like in other countries. We talk about different dimensions of representation, scale, shape, function, identity, all of these different dimensions that have to be at least considered. And we look at, do we have a good system today? And could a single change improve it. 
What can an 1100 member Congress do for you? And other thoughts about representation. I want to thank you for listening and appreciate your time considering this offer. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com.